Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting harvesting happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. All righty then, let's dive in. This episode offers psychosocial education designed to inspire and motivate our listeners. The information provided does not constitute a therapeutic relationship nor a substitute for professional mental health care. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or for listeners in the United States, text 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn about grit, grace, and the power tools of courage. My guest today is Bishop Marianne Edgar Buddy. She is the author of How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. Bishop Buddy is the Bishop and Spiritual Leader of the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, D.C. and the Washington National Cathedral. Prior to her election in 2011, she was a parish priest in Minneapolis for 18 years. Bishop Buddy has appeared on the PBS NewsHour, Meet the Press, Good Morning America, and the Today Show, among others. Marianne has also earned her Master's in Divinity and Doctor of Ministry from Virginia Theological Seminary. And I am delighted to have you with me today, Marianne. I'm really excited to talk about this subject. Thank you. I'm so happy to be with you as well, Lisa. I'm grateful for the invitation. Me too. Let's talk about your inspiration to write the book, How We Learn to Be Brave. Well, you know, it comes, inspiration is such a mystery uh, yes. in its, its uh, inception, its, um, its follow through. It has a lot to do with what you said at the beginning about grit and grace. Um, the, the, the catalytic event was uh, one of those relatively rare moments when my life um, is kind of goes into a spotlight when people other than the those in my immediate world are aware of uh, my work. And that was when I was um, took a public statement in opposition to our former president when he used one of our churches as a backdrop um, in the midst of the real tumultuous events of June of 2020 after George Floyd's murder. And that... Um, in that moment, there was a fair amount of uh, conversation about the bravery or the courage that was required in that in, in that action, which at the time, frankly, didn't feel like courage to me. And we can talk about that later if you like. But what precipitated the writing was when people asked me to reflect on that, I realized that my understanding of courage is so much deeper than moments of of uh, notoriety, if you will, or of public um, awareness, and has far more to do with the day-to-day living that sets a direction for a given life. And those decisive moments, most of which are unknown to anyone except ourselves and a small group of people, that those are the things that really make for a courageous life, or those are the moments that teach us where courage, how courage evolves. And that's, so that's what inspired me. And, and then the book took on its, its own life as I reflected on those themes in a deeper way. And how would you describe the, the knowing that is required to help with the deciding as you right. call it, to go, to stay, to start, to stop, whatnot. Right, right. Well, I think there's a, in in my experience, and I also draw upon the life stories of all manner of people from 
you know, historical figures to people that I admire now to characters in literature. And there seems to be an inner prompting or an inner energy that uh, that that is on some level um, un unanswerable until we it, it doesn't go away until we tend to it. And that that inner prompting and it, it can have external um, it, it can be caused by external events, but something happens inside us that builds to an awareness that we have a decision to make. And it can be large or small. It can be public or private. It can have, you know, consequences that span decades, or it can be something immediate in the moment. But there's this awareness that we have come to a moment of choice. And so I, I try to, I mean, I, I don't know how to answer where that comes from. <laughs> that, that has, you know, that's just the stuff of mystery. But I do think we all know what it feels like to reach a point where we are summoned by life, by our circumstances, by some spiritual force that is beyond any adequate naming that calls us into a space where we have to move or do something or act in some way that calls us beyond our, to use the, the, the phrase, our comfort zone now. It, usually calls us to some place of risk or of unknowing that starts us on a path and we and we follow it and so i that's what i try to try to give language to what those experiences can feel like over the course of a life what i'm hearing from what you're describing is is almost like the the needle of the internal compass has like a little spark like it gets a little, mm -hmm. a little electrical jolt that it has to somehow move direction in some way. And you can't describe where that electrical impulse is coming from, but it is, it, you know, it's right. just something that happens. Right. Now, in fairness, in our consciousness, uh, much of that is happening in response to our lives and our life circumstances, right? Things happen, things change something presents itself, an opportunity presents itself, an opportunity is denied us. Uh, there is something that requires a response in some way. So I think that's one whole category of how that spark gets lit. Um, and then there are the other ones that are more internal. And, and there's a developmental aspect to that as well, that certain sparks within us are lit at certain stages of our lives and that it's as mysterious as how a child learns to walk, right? If you've ever been around a child who is learning to walk, you can tell that there is something internal happening that is motivating that child to move from a crawl or a holding on to a ledge to taking those first steps alone. And there's, for me, that's one of the most powerful images of what it feels like because you can see on a child's face that she or he knows exactly <laughs> what's happening right there is something really big happening right now and usually at that point of awareness is when they tumble over and fall on their hopefully well padded bottom but you know what i'm saying that there's this sense of inner drive that comes as a result of the circumstances or the place in life that calls those to mind calls those moments to our to our four Right. Going back to your catalyst, I want mm -hmm. to just reflect upon you sort of stepping into public truth about, mm -hmm. in a brave way, about yeah. what you believe to be true mm -hmm. and how that, whether you agree or disagree, one disagrees, it doesn't matter, but the respect right. that we must pay to ourselves and each other when we have the gumption, when we have that grit and that grace to walk into that light of truth. Right, right. In part, it was a response to the fact of I'm a person and my job is as the spiritual leader of 86 Episcopal churches in the Washington, D.C. area. And one of them is directly situated across the, uh, from the White House. Yep. And so in part, the response was 
because some momentous things were happening right on the grounds of a church under my care. And, and in some ways, when, when the events unfolded the way they did, some response was required. And I knew, even though I was sitting in my living room with my mother, who had just come into our home because of the COVID pandemic, right? I had to move her into our house and we were sitting on the couch watching television and these events were happening in real time. I knew that, I knew because I knew and I knew because people were contacting me, asking me not for my response, right? There was this summons both internally and externally that said, we, we need, you need to respond to this, right? It was a, and there wasn't a lot of time, right? So there wasn't a lot of time to think. And, and I spent some time in the writing, Lisa, dwelling on those moments when we don't have a lot of time to think that <laughs> life is, you know, we just don't have time, yeah. right? And so for good or for ill, um, we may regret it later, but we are called upon to act. And I, I use the metaphor of baseball, like when it's a baseball player's turn it bat. It doesn't really matter how the player feels about that, you know, it doesn't, nothing, it's, it's his turn, her turn, and there you are, and you, you step up and you swing, right? So it's that kind of, so you're almost going on muscle memory and on instinct or intuition more than on conscious thought. And those moments are relatively rare, but when they happen, boy, do we know it. And, and people often talk about being on autopilot, right? Or like if they describe what happened almost as if they were in a dream sequence, right? There was just all these things happening and I, and then you fill in the blank. I put my foot on the brake or I jumped in the water or I, I leapt from my, you know, from, right? You know, there's yes. these things that happen and people say, how do you do that? And on one level you say, well, I have no idea. And on another, when you look back, you can say, well, actually, there were a number of reasons why. Um, there are a number of things I can point to to say, yeah, that's that's kind of how that happened because of all of these things that were true. And so in, in my instance, in that case, it was a moment of I was the person in the position that had the ability to say something. And the and the question was, was I going to say something or was I going to let it pass? And I made the decision that one of our churches and the sacred texts of our tradition could not be used in the way that the former president chose to use them without evoking some response on our part. Right. It was a it was a in my you know, again, I understand people might disagree, but in my sense, it was it was a violation of our it was taking on and assuming the sacred the mantle of our of our tradition to justify a political position. And I just, I had to, I had to say, no, that's not, that's not what that's for. And, um, and, and also there was a lot of suffering happening in that moment. Yes. And we wanted to be known to being on the side of compassion and solidarity. So that was that. And so if you want to ask me more about that, that's fine. But that's, that's kind of how that came down. Well, what's coming to mind as you're describing that moment in time is, you know, the world was watching. It was right. it wasn't just your group of churches, the 86, right. you know, churches that mm -hmm. you were the steward, caretaker, overseer, you know, mm -hmm. safeguard for it was the world was watching this unfold and somebody had to be the adult and stand up for what was right. Right. And that was you. And, <laughs> that was right. your moment. And and you know how rare that is, right? Yes. I mean, how many how many times do any of us step into that space and do what's right? And absolutely no one is watching, right? Yes. It's not. And so if on some level, if if the motivation is to have the world watch, we, we become very desperate people looking for the limelight. So that's not the point at all. And one of the things that I um, I think anyone has to learn who has any public life at all is that what matters most in our work is integrity over days of no drama, right? When we can still be counted on to show up and do what's right, even when no one's watching, right? When the microphones go away, yeah. when the cameras are gone, are you still going to be there? Are you still going to be in the, in the cause, you know, working for the cause that that moment represents? And that, that's a, that's a larger issue for us in a in a culture that is accustomed to 
moments that can be uh, curated in, you know, on video or through social media. Well, it was the flip side of the same coin. Your response to the attention-seeking behaviors was the medicine. Right. For us, you know, for the average person. For many. Yes, for many. many. We need to take a break. When we come back, we will continue the conversation with my guest today, Bishop Marianne Edgar Buddy. We're talking about her book, How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. To learn more, please go to edow.org. Under the About section, you can look up Bishop Marion. To find her on Twitter, go to at me, B-U-D-D-E, at me, Buddy, on Facebook, Bishop Marianne Buddy, and on Instagram, Marianne Buddy. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that actually is a promise. Hang on just a second. Before we pause, let's talk about the importance of small self-care rituals and our happiness. It's been proven that small, consistent actions generate a positive impact in our lives, like taking a few minutes to hit the pause button and breathe or connecting with a friend. And sometimes those small actions pay off in a big way. Way offers a complete hair care solution that promotes fuller looking, healthier feeling, and happier hair for everyone. Fine, medium, or thick hair, Way has got you covered. For the past several months, I've made Way an integral part of my self care routine, and I'm seeing and feeling a noticeable difference in the quality of my once flat, limp, and dull, fine hair. I'm a big fan of Way's hair, body, and fragrance products. My go to's are the hair shampoo and conditioner for fine hair, plus the volume spray. They make my hair full, bouncy, and not to mention, all Way products smell sensually delicious. Another thing I appreciate about Way is that they offer 32 ounce refill pouches of their most beloved shampoos and conditioners. Way helps to improve overall hair health with beauty boosting ingredients that support thicker, shinier, beautiful looking tresses. Way is an easy and effective go to hair and scalp health regime because good hair care demands more than just styling. Get on your way to healthier hair one day at a time with shampoos and conditioners that are just your type. Go to T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com and use code H-H for 15% off your entire purchase. That's T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com, code H-H. Now let's pause. We'll be right back. Each day we have the intellectual freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable, regardless of external circumstance. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, urge them to seek professional support because good psychological health is vital in achieving a satisfying life. Visit HarvestingHappiness.com for psychosocial educational resources to boost emotional and social intelligence. Like what you hear on Harvesting Happiness? Sharing is caring. Pay it forward by spreading the word to your tribe through social media. Find us at Harvesting Happiness on Facebook and me at Lisa Kamen on Twitter. And we're back continuing the conversation with Bishop Marianne Edgar Buddy. We're talking about grit, grace, and the power tools of courage. Let's get back to it. So Bishop Marianne, let's talk a little bit for the average human when they reach those decisive moments in life deciding to go stay and to start what words of encouragement would you give us one of the things that i think is is so interesting for any of us to do is to look back on our lives no matter how old we are and to think about the 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 turning points or the anchor events around which the narrative of our life can be told right and often we will come to or we'll start, you know, we'll start our story with events that had some kind of catalytic power, and that, and at the center of that event was a decision that we, that we made, even if that decision was in response to something beyond our control. And so, for example, as as you said just now, one of the more decisive moments in every human being's life. Um, are those time, or, or is the time, and there's uh, usually many over the course of decades, when we come to the realization that it is time for us to leave where we are, physical, spiritual, relational, and go somewhere else. And it it's a very clear sense that we are called 
uh, to let go of something that is defining to us, be it a geographic location, employment, relationship, and move towards something else. Typically that we, we can only see on the borders of our horizon, we're not 100% sure where the, you know, where the destination lay. And that's certainly true in all the great spiritual traditions have at their core some kind of journey that our forebears were summoned to take. It's also the, the stuff of every great, every great novel, every great movie, coming of age stories, the heroic path as laid out in mythology and in um, and in some of the great sagas of humankind. And so I like to think of that as probably the archetype or the one that comes to mind most readily for us. And how does that happen? So that's one really big one, very developmentally appropriate as we emerge from adolescence into adulthood, but it can happen several times across a lifetime. There's always loss involved. There's always a rearranging of social relationships and a formation of new community. So that's one. On the other end of the spectrum is the same sense of decision and, and you know, sense of urgency around decision, but the decision is, is the exact opposite. And that is in the force of, in response to all kinds of impulses that w might be encouraging us to go, we actually sense that the true call is to stay, to stay where we are and go deeper to persevere in relationship, to find our identity and new sense of call and life right where we are in the neighborhoods we're in rather than the ones we are drawn to. Do you hear what I'm saying? That sense of like, I'm going to yes. stick this out. I'm not, I'm not going to leave. I'm going to stay here. Um, similarly, there is that sense that um, all of us have had in one form or another when we realize that we, we want to we see a goal in the distant horizon and we want and we feel called to start moving toward it with full awareness that getting from where we are to what that goal is is going to take a very long time and require lots of steps along the way the more obvious being when any of us decide to undertake a long course of study that will lead to a profession say um, and i i write of one woman who as a young mother of three decided that she really, she was going to at last pursue her dream of becoming a nurse. But that meant for her going back to remedial courses in college at night for four or five years while her kids were in school, then enrolling in nursing school, then getting her first job. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's like, it took her a decade yeah. to reach that goal. But at one moment when she was caring for her third child, the dream came to her with such force that she knew she was going to start walking toward it. So those are three of the, um, I think there are seven that I write of in the book, but just to get a sense of the universality of them. But the thread line or the through line is, I'm thinking of Joseph Campbell's work and the call to adventure, right? That, yes. That, that, yes. that the catalyst for this being called to, to answer the call, go, go through the threshold into the unknown to embark on this journey that will have its ups and downs and adventures. Um, it's required for the development of the story or for us as a human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're, we're wired for this yeah. in, some, in some very real way. And um, and there are occasions, um, tragically, when those journeys are thwarted by circumstances uh, beyond our control. Um, there are lives that um, feel no sense no sense of urgency around that by because of the you know the way and, and those just seem to me like this the real one of the greatest tragedies of the human life is when people aren't able to experience that because it is so innate to us. Um, on the other hand, I, I write. Um, I write a chapter on accepting, accepting things that we would never choose and through accepting them, help make them part of our destiny, right? So that is in some ways to say, life throws us curveballs all the time and crises and tragedies happen all around us. And sometimes they happen to us. And what do we do in response to them? And we can find great courage meaning, purpose, and life transformation when we accept 
the things that we would never choose and then use that that as raw material for something to create something of our lives of true muni beauty and meaning for other people um, and uh, and it's a hard choice and we wouldn't wish it on anyone that we love but it's also inspiring to see how that can unfold in other people and and also certainly for ourselves and that is bravery when when it's we're huge. able to do that yeah. huge bravery like, that's huge. extraordinary bravery actually right. i think uh, it is and it it's um and it can be so it can be so empowering in the sense that it it allows a kind of freedom to say, we aren't dependent on everything going our way for us to live courageous, meaningful lives or, yeah. or happy, even happy lives, right? That we are not bound by our circumstances as powerful as they are, um, that there is a driving energy of life. There's a life force within us that will find its expression and um, and part of our life's work is to is to is to answer that to, to respond to that life force and live it. And what I'm hearing from what you're saying also is that in addition to this this bravery, albeit extraordinary or ordinary, that this happens on a soul level. Too. Mm. It doesn't happen just in the intellect. It happens mm -hmm. in, in the heart and in the soul and within the spirit of each one of us, not even speaking from a religious re perspective. Mm -hmm. No, it's, a, it, it's, it's definitely that part of us that um, it's everything, right? It's the whole, as the Buddhists say, it's the whole catastrophe, right? Body, <laughs> yes. soul, emotions, right? I mean, it's all of it, right? We, we're, not, we're not one thing or the other, right? We are our embodied spirits with uh, extraordinary capacity for imagination and for creativity, for grit, yeah. for perseverance, to rise from disappointment, to rise from failure, even on some uh, metaphysical level as we live, to rise from death, to rise from the experiences that we would, by all accounts, describe as a death experience and having, having life emerge from the ashes of what of whatever whatever has befallen us that that is the miracle and the genius of the human species and um, to be able to fully realize that or even partially realize that in the course of our lives is what makes this adventure to use your word there um, both universal and very particular right because it's we get to live our lives, right? We get to not 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 each not each other's lives, not vicarious lives, but the life that we alone can live. I don't think I can say anything <laughs> beyond <laughs> what you've just said, because oh. that was like put that put a fine point on it, you know. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, and it's 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 for all of us, you know. Um, yeah. It's for all of us. It's There's not no just exclusion for, to this club. There's no, it's, not, it's not just. It's not just for the select. It's yeah. it, you know. It's um, there's. It's we can all do this, and we can all live lives of deep purpose and joy um, with the raw materials that are given to us, and the ways that our creative energies and that mystical energy upon which we all depend um, helps create a beautiful and courageous life. And when we think about the fear that, that is mm. pervasive and lives in society today, mm -hmm. the antidote is what you describe, right? The yes. antidote is rising above the fear with right. this uh, bravery and courage and grit and grace in the toolbox mm -hmm. to go out and live this life. Yeah. And one step at a time, right? You know, one, they, they're all small steps. Every once in a while, it feels like a huge leap, right? But it really is um, that most of these steps, most of these decisions, most of these moments are small, but they, they build upon one another and they move us into places where, uh, and opportunities for, um, for the, the sort of, um, like I said, those moments that we would hang our life story on, right? But there, those those moments are no 
are no more significant than all the moments that preceded and followed. It's those are just the ones where the energies coalesced to bring about to bring about that change, right? Yeah. And then then we must live with the implications of that, right? This is which is um, which is living according to the to the to the moments that we've been given. Which I think is uh, um, which is as, which requires as much courage as anything else, because the emotionality of the the drama of those moments will fade, and the our even our confidence in them will eventually fade. And then we have the daily task of reminding ourselves, no, this is who I am. This is this is what my life. This is part of who what I'm meant to do and to be, even when it doesn't feel, even when it feels like it's you know we're just slogging through. Like even those moments. And maybe especially so, are the stuff of bravery, and the yeah. stuff of courage, and know? the courage to just show up. I think. To show to show up, up. right? <laughs> right. To show up and to acknowledge, like, okay, you know, I don't feel I don't feel very loving today, but my I have chosen to love. I have chosen yes. to love these people. I have chosen to love this family. I have chosen to love this community, and I believe that that's what I'm here to do. Or you know, fill in the blank, right? Um, if you are in the work of social change, most social change happens beneath the surface and only rarely does it come to the kind of consciousness that, you know, shifts an entire society. None of that happens without generations of people just putting one foot in front of the other toward toward a dream that's yeah. been placed in their hearts. So Con- continuing yeah. to show up, <laughs> yeah. it's, you so, know, Yay us, you know, for the ones who do, just when we show up and yeah. when we do, when we offer what we can and, um, and allow ourselves the, uh, the freedom to be imperfect and to be fully human so that when things don't go according to some idealized script, we don't fall flat on our face or pick up our toys and go home, but continue on. Um, and that's how, that's how we become that's how we become sturdy in this life, you know, and, and resilient in, yeah. in the path and frankly, trusting that there's more at play in the universe than what we can see or control. And, uh, and I believe that. I do too. <laughs> hmm. Bishop Marianne Edgar, buddy, thank you so much Ooh, for thank you, Lisa. giving us all a dose of soul food today. <laughs> That's what I feel <laughs> like I've received. <laughs> Oh, bless you. I, I've, as, as have I, it's just been wonderful speaking with you, Lisa, and I so admire your work and the goodness that you strive to put forth in the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The book we're speaking about is How We Learn to Be Brave, Decisive Moments in Life and Faith. To learn more about Bishop Marianne Edgar Buddy, please visit edow.org under the About section. Plug in Bishop Marianne. On Twitter, you can find her at me buddy and that's b-u-d-d-e on facebook bishop marianne buddy and on instagram marianne buddy come back and hang out again okay <laughs> please anytime thank you thank, thank you, you very much and, and my best to all your listeners thanks for joining us on harvesting happiness today this is lisa cypress Kamen on behalf of my guest bishop marianne edgar buddy wishing you kind thoughts kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mangeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck and Alec Gus in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.